Um, again, with this framework of the 10 questions that we have been asking uh, ourselves that we are excited to share with um, everybody else. This question about what can we learn from people who are outside of our U.S. music bubble. And, and again, it feels like there's a fine line between a network and a click. And a lot of us have spent a lot of time on a lot of Zooms over the past uh, year um, talking to you know each other and, and learning and, and doing a lot of really effective work. But sometimes um, it's important to really engage with folks who, who are in different sectors, have different perspectives of the world. Um, so we're breaking this into to two parts. The first part, we've got um, some of my favorite people are going to be sharing their perspectives and uh, insight uh, from across dif different arts disciplines and across the creative economy. And then we're going to uh, bring in some global perspectives uh, as well. So with that, I'm thrilled to turn over to my MPF co-founder, uh, the wonderful Anna Chalinza. Michael, it's been amazing to work with you. And I just have to say the last two days, these sessions, I'm just getting lots of inspiration. So it's a, it's a good pick me up. Um, it, I'm thrilled for our panel today because I think a lot of times, as Michael said, we do live in a bubble and we all have probably other bubbles that we connect with and uh, we can learn a lot from that. So if you all don't mind, I'd just love for each of you to just, I'll you know kind of start it off. And if you could talk a little bit about what you do sort of outside the music bubble and what is something, what's a lesson that you've learned from that area that, that we could apply to music. And I'll, I'll start off with Marianne. Hey, thank you, uh, Anna. I'm so happy to be here and to be with the three of you who I haven't seen in ages. So this kind of makes me excited. You've, you know, yeah, so nice to see you all. Um, uh, so my, I work, I uh, run the DC Creative Affairs Office here in Washington, DC. And from that perspective, uh, we really are looking at all of the creative industries. And so the work that we do really essential to it is the interconnectedness of, uh, of all of those different creative industries and how they are more similar than they are dissimilar which I think is uh, um, enormously important in this work because I think it's easy for us to get stuck in, in the, the bubble that we're in and forget that there are common challenges that we all have. And then when we work together, we usually can solve problems as a unit easier than we can solve problems as individuals. And I think that, yes, there are some times when there are things that are unique to industries that we need to understand. But if we get too deep in the rabbit hole of those uniquenesses, often we uh, lose sight of the bigger picture. Um, and so, uh, you know, for our work in the creative industries, uh, we were really looking for the commonalities and how are we solving problems for all of our industries together. Wonderful. And so, Jesse, I'll go right to you, Jesse Elliott. Hey, everyone. Um, uh, for those of you I don't know, and there are quite a few of you on here who I do, it's amazing to see your faces and hear your brilliant ideas again, and especially to be with you all specifically on this panel. Um, I am now living in Arkansas. I'm working uh, on a newly formed organization called CASH, C-A-C-H-E. It stands for Creative Arkansas Community Hub and Exchange. Um, and in some ways, we're sort of like a uh, regional arts council meets chamber of commerce meets switchboard meets public library, um, as Marianne said, for, for really all the creative industries. And we define arts, culture and creativity very, very intentionally broadly and are really trying to bring in more and more folks into uh, under, under that umbrella, uh, especially folks in communities who maybe traditionally haven't been considered or haven't consider themselves art makers or creatives or whatever you want to call it. But um, I'll just leave it at that for now. I, I actually know most of you from uh, my, my doing my time in music, uh, which has been most of my adult life, uh, both as a performer and as a, as a, as a talking head on, uh, on Zoom, <laughs> um, but doing a lot of music cities and music ecosystems work, especially in Colorado. So uh, for me, I'm kind of an insider outsider in this conversation in different ways. And I'll talk more about that later. Wonderful. And Philippa. Hi, um, I am based in Washington, D.C. And most recently, uh, I am the director of a project called Looking for America. And in this project, we travel around the country 
curating art experiences for people from across the political spectrum to have conversations um, with each other. And we answer the question, what does it mean to be American? And the idea is to bring people together in a multi-partisan way to actually talk to each other and to dismantle the polarization industrial complex. And so I came at that work, you know, from a very personal perspective, um, just my own curiosity about other people, people who don't think like me. But um, a lot of what informs the work now for me is that I, you know, I've been, I've been involved in the DC art world in many capacities for many years, but um, most significantly in creative placemaking. Um, creative placemaking is a sort of amorphous kind of area that is really hard to define, but you know, it does, and, and in part because it does involve many different kinds of um, it, knowledges, um, psychology, sociology, plan, city planning, architecture, all the different kinds of things. So um, I, I am very interested in this idea of how do we draw information and inspiration from many different places that you might not normally expect to. So this is actually the perfect place, um, perfect panel. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to think about the, those connections with the music world too. Oh, thank you. One, this, this is wonderful. I'm, um, I'm also in DC. I'm a professor uh, of music, music history, um, and that sort of thing. And I, I will say to, to sort of talk about some of the things that I've learned where I'm seeing parallels or not parallels. One thing that's been interesting in the classroom, um, suddenly being on Zoom, is uh, as much as we've heard a lot of conversation about, and I'm talking about college students, about how difficult it is and students are you know, not able to be on campus and have those experiences. Um, one thing that I found that that I didn't expect with Zoom and uh, was that, like, you can't sit in the back of the room anymore, with at least with a smaller class. So what I'm finding is students that maybe in the past would sit in the back and kind of put their hoodie over or, or their baseball cap or not, you know, try to avoid eye contact. It's sort of impossible um, on Zoom. And they're actually engaging more. So there's some ways where I think all of our faces that, and we're all equidistant from each other, um, it does create a sense. And, and I, I feel that that's something that some performers are starting to discover too when they're doing online performances and then they're interacting that it's not like they're the people that are sitting back in the nosebleed section versus the expensive seats up front. Um, everybody is there and I think there, there's something to, to be said for that. Um, I'm curious to just with your experiences, Jesse, you've kind of, you've shifted to a new area um, in Arkansas. So can you talk a little bit, even regionally, what you're learning or, or are there things we can learn going from one region to another? Yeah, I could talk all day about that. I'll, just for <laughs> context, um, so before I, I helped with the state music strategy for the state of Colorado and, and with the city music strategy for the city of Denver, and then I um, was the founding director of a place called the Music District. Some of you have been there before. Uh, it's sort of a physical campus. Um, uh, my, my title here now is uh, Director of Creative Ecosystems, and that very much is um, playing off on my long-standing interest in the ecosystem concept. Um, I've always loved the term music cities, but I think in the work that I've done, especially in places that are a little more off the beaten path, maybe smaller uh, spots, the ecosystem concept has kind of come in handy because it, you're not always talking about cities and urbanism in, in, that, in that sort of strict sense. So... Um, it, 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 there's fascinating comparisons between Arkansas and where I was in Colorado. Um, in some ways, actually, they're very, very, very shockingly similar places. People are surprised to learn that. Um, but I would say, um, you know, one of the one of the biggest things is that in a place like one of the biggest points of comparison, I would say, is that they 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 don't have hyper mature enough uh, systems across any of the creative industries for any of them to truly go their own way, if you will. And so, in a sense, they're sort of interdisciplinary by nature, right? Which is why um, we thought it made sense when I was uh, uh, getting hired by Allison Esposito, who I think a lot of you know um, from the arts and philanthropy world as well. She helped. Um, uh, do a lot of stuff in Chicago and a lot of stuff in Boston before this. And they brought her down here to basically say, we need this connective fiber. It's the thing that we don't have, even though we've got a couple world-class art museums now, and it's the area is getting famous for some other things. All of that is to say, I think we don't, we creatives, artists of all these different disciplines don't have a choice, but to sort of team up and learn lessons from each other because there's just not enough scale 
for any of those things to be super robust. And, and I don't say that in a derogatory way. I think it's actually kind of one of the beautiful things about an ecosystem like this is that there is a lot more natural cross collaboration. I have lots more to say on that, but I'm, I'm, I'll leave it that for now. Um, so Marianne, if I can ask, you also have this amazing uh, blog that you do. Uh, so I'm just gonna say uh, Human Capital, I've been following it now for, it's been about a year. So can you talk a little bit about how those worlds are colliding, how, you know, and cause it's not like it's all about music, it's about many other things, but there's a real sense of sort of being there for a lot of people during COVID. I don't think that was your plan to start off with, but it's definitely become something even bigger than what you started. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, I started a project at the beginning of 2020 to write this newsletter, like put one out once a week and talk about uh, primarily uh, community building and, and humans, right? And how important the humans are because at the center of anything that we do is all based on the human connection that we have. Like nothing happens in a vacuum and nothing does nothing happens without you knowing other people. And so I think uh, to, to Jesse's point and then both to Philippa's point too, that that the people we know, the communities that we build or the communities that we're a part of will, will help drive the kind of opportunity and the connectedness that, um, uh, that follows, right? And I think to make that happen, you have to have a mindset to understand that uh, you need other people. And that sounds kind of obvious, but I do think that sometimes it, it, um, it, it bears mentioning, right? That we do need other people and we need to seek out other people. And we uh, need to seek out people who are different than us because as artists and creative people, curiosity reigns supreme. And curiosity uh, can only flourish when we're around people that inspire us, who challenge us, who question us, who, who teach us uh, that we can learn from and that we can give back to too. But at the same point in time, we also need to make tactical choices, you know, to, to, to give back to our community and to, to learn from that. So we need to, to, to make a tactical choice of the people that we wanna connect with, the events, partnerships, collaborations that we wanna do, you know, and also the kind of, media, the kind of things, education that we consume, right? So I, I think being able to center people first, you know, make it kind of a human capital oriented uh, uh, work that you do really is going to engender a lot of opportunity and build the ecosystems that, that really allow us to thrive. That's fabulous. And it's, I, I can't help but see that as a perfect segue to Philippa, your work of uh, looking for America. So I'm just going to let you kind of continue that conversation. I, I was literally going to say everything Marianne just said, um, you know, the, it, it, I mean, dare I say, if we don't reach outside of our normal groups and, and bubbles, you know, we are threatening our democracy. It's literally at the root of what is like causing our democracy to start, you know, appear to fail right now. Anyway, sorry. So I don't want to go off into that tangent, but Everything Marianne just said, you know, I've been thinking a lot too about how, you know, in a nuts and bolts kind of way, um, I was very resistant to even using Zoom as to continue my project because I felt like we have to have in-person meetings. This is the only way. And I still be deeply believe that that is very important and we need to have, you know, um, I, I mean, people really miss in-person music experiences. There is absolutely something to that that is unbeatable. But that said, um, I've been thinking a lot about how we can be more adaptive to our new world of technology and Zoom and how it's actually really helped my work a lot in terms of being able to bring people together who would not normally be able to meet. Um, mm -hmm. I've, I've organized people from Alaska and El Paso and Sioux City in the same conversation and that could have never happened before now. So I when thinking about how you know, when we can gather again, I don't want to let go of what I have learned about how to bring people together um, using the mechanisms that, that I was forced to use and I didn't really want to use right now, but that can be very useful. And there's a guy who wrote a book called uh, Palaces for the People. And he said that, you know, we need to think about using this kind of technology as a supplement. It'll never be a substitute, but it can be a great supplement to the day when we can actually gather again. No, I think that's so true. And, and I guess to, to kind of circle back with this, what do we learn from other, from other disciplines? Um, one thing I've noticed here in DC, uh, and I'm 
you guys, I'm sure you've noticed it as well. And I, I don't know if this is happening in Arkansas or not, but since COVID, there have been a lot more mural projects. So even when they've, the a shop has put wood up, instantly someone comes in and they paint a mural. And at the same time, because of COVID issues and everything, when someone goes out and starts to busk and play music, they're shut down. And so I, I do think... I, I don't know if there's some way we can, you know, cr create a, a more equitable system, but I'm curious, Jesse, had, I mean, you, I noticed you sort of moving when I, when I was talking about murals, I, I wonder if you can say anything about those, because, because the ecosystem right now, it's not quite equilibrial. Yeah, I was just saying, that, I mean, certainly here, I just typed in the comment section, um, we've had tons of mural projects get funded. And, and what's exciting for me, and it's actually exciting to be working in a place now coming mostly from a music, but actually before that from a film and writing background, those were sort of my original artistic disciplines. And it's really fun to be in a place where the predominantly known uh, art form is visual art um, because of Crystal Bridges Museum and, if, and no one's heard of or been to Crystal Bridges before. It is one of the greatest museums in the world I've ever been to and a very new museum in the sense of really tries really, really hard to connect with community of all sorts to connect with kids and schools and you know buses in folks from across the state of Arkansas to come see this sort of amazing place. I think as a result of Crystal Bridges presence here and now the Momentary which is sort of its younger sister um, R&D more experimental more avant-garde more workshoppy thing where they have like a huge Nick Cave and I don't mean the music world Nick Cave I mean uh, <laughs> the other famous Nick Cave there's just an incredible exhibition there and they do a lot of stuff with because uh, nature is another big thing. And a lot of folks don't know that this is called the natural state. And it's actually not a, it's actually not a exaggeration. It's a absolutely gorgeous state. And there's a lot of more intertwining, especially in the last six months between outdoors and environmentalism and the arts and especially the visual arts, murals, sculptures, et cetera. They're really intertwining stuff in fascinating ways. There's a big exhibit up right now called North Forest Lights in the in the forest outside of Crystal Bridges that is this like otherworldly walk through the woods and light and sound and all these other really, really fascinating uh, installations. So yeah, that's just to agree with you. Essentially, it's, it certainly is as as we turn more and more towards the outdoors, I think it's natural that things like murals, things like physically distances, distance performances, festivals, etc, are, are going to crop up. And I'm also just as a quick side note, because I can't help myself, uh, Philippa, this one's for you. I, don't watch this now, but I'm going to paste a, uh, my, my single favorite video of the entire year that was made by a, a lot of our mutual friend Tao Nguyen of Tao and the Get Down, Stay Down. She made pretty much the greatest Zoom music video of all time. And if you haven't seen it, uh, you have to see it. But don't click on it yet. Just save it for after our panel or save it for the happy hour. But anytime I need inspiration to get on a Zoom call, I just go and watch Tao's video and I'm like, oh yeah, this can be fun. This can be art. This can be creative. This can be collaborative across disciplines, et cetera. Here you go. Thank you. Marianne, any, any comments? Because you're working across the arts and so in DC, I'm curious, anything we can learn from the visual artists folks or anything we can learn <clears throat> from the filmmakers? Yeah, you know, I, I think that, um, well, one thing I think uh, uh, boundaries are good for art, right? Like, I, I do think that that, that there has been a, an enormous opportunity for artists to be responding to this past year and in ways that have been wildly creative and cathartic um, and something that has been not only meaningful to them, but I think meaningful to, to all of us who consume that. And um, one uh, artist that I'm particularly excited about right now is a photographer and visual artist named Violetta Marcou, Marque Lou, actually. And, and she was struggling during the, the process of COVID and, and she's a photographer and, and she was trying to figure out exactly uh, how to process what she was going through. And so she started just calling her friends who were small business owners and entrepreneurs and, and said, hey, are you feeling like I'm feeling? Tell me how you're feeling. And they would have conversations and then she'd like say, can I come shoot you, right? Can I come photograph you? Can we have this conversation together? And out of that is this beautiful series of photographs and interviews of 
all of these small businesses processing what they're going through, you know, and, and, and you would think that they would all be really, really negative, right? Like, and really, really hard. And there, there are certainly moments where they're talking about what's happening to their mental health. Um, but at the same point in time, they all are really figuring out how to make it okay, right? You know, they're looking for the positive, they're looking for the pivot, they're looking for the opportunity to rise up, rise above, rise beyond. And, and it's very empowering, right? It's beautiful. I'll, I'll put the information in, in the chat here. But um, so I do think that, that there's a lot of artists who have been responding to this in a way that has been um, wildly meaningful and powerful and maybe approaching things that never would have occurred to them previously. You know, and I hope that some of that energy and some of that inspiration stays with us. I, I, I know for me, even myself, just going through this process, I want to bring things into the new normal that I've learned from this, that, um, that make me grateful, that all of that. Sort of like Philippa has said, this idea of taking this connectivity that we have all over the world now and making sure that I don't take that for granted as we move, you know, into whatever comes next. Yeah, and I think there's an important lesson there too, because um, again, just to give a reference to teaching and students, um, students that are now seniors and are interviewing for jobs, like they're starting to do their online interviews, um, they're coming back to me and telling me a question they're often asked is, so what have you been doing with your COVID time? You know, this idea that we have this extra time. And so, um, Philippon, I, I wonder, you're, you know, you've been talking to people all over the country. What are, are people discovering, like, new pockets of things to do with their COVID time? <laughs> or are you finding ways to help that pr promote your project? Yeah, I will say I reject that question of COVID time because in the beginning, like for about a month at the beginning, I felt like I had a lot of time, but ever since things <laughs> people started adapting, like people adapt. And I, maybe, you know, that's for me, that's the answer is like, we, we figured it out after um, I, I figured it out. And now I feel like I'm, busy. And I think people that I know are busy. I mean, aside from the emotional aspect of it, which can be very devastating, which I don't diminish at all. But I, I think that if you're wasting your time right now. <laughs> no, I'm not saying wasting. I'm not saying oh, wasting. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'm not, I, I must have. I'm sorry. I must have. No, I, meant, I just meant like, what do you do? So, I mean, I think some yeah. are discovering new hobbies or just because uh -huh. we're not, we're not, we don't have the commuting time. We don't, I mean, there's, there are some extra pockets of time. And I think yeah, yeah. The time and a lot of people are reaching beyond just like what, well, what their path was. Kind of going back to, you know, what I said earlier and to build on what Marianne was saying is that, um, Right. Just just this week, um, uh, two students from University of Michigan actually reached out to me to do a little project. And, you know, I thought, like, this is amazing. That's how they're using their time is they decided they wanted to do a project around how art can help um, increase Im improve mental health. And so we're going to work on this together. And I thought, well, that's really cool because I don't know how I doubt that we would have been connected in any other way. But for COVID, forcing us to think about different things and for the ability to reach out in the way that they reached out to me. So I, my experience so far has been greater creativity because yeah. there's more opportunity out there. And, and I've, I'm, I feel very hopeful actually. And, you know, once we can move past, um, you know, getting, once we can actually get a vaccine and people can actually not be fearful, um, I think a whole new world has opened up. No, I think you're exactly right. And I think people are um, finding just new, even new ways to connect. So I know, you know, a lot of musicians who, you know, can't play in the same room anymore. And, you know, they tried, oh, could we play on the, but there's, there are just new ways of, of learning new skills, even with uh, recording arts and coming up with new ways of putting together a, what, what does it mean to collaborate in different ways and the visual element and all of that sort of thing. So I do think it's, it, in a lot of ways, it can, it, it can be difficult, you know, flourishing is hard, you know, when there's, when there's isolation, but there's also a way that, um, like the, these two terms, I like to think of a stretch and play and stretch is what really makes you, it's hard and it's difficult and you really have to stretch to, to, to kind of get to where you want to be. But then once you're there, you can really play. And, and I mean, like experiment with sort of joy. And I think that COVID at first we were really stretching hard to deal with it, but I think where some of us are starting to find 
the ability to, to find some space to play in, in a really positive way. Um, we have about five minutes left. So I just, I, I don't want to keep any of you from if there was a topic or something you want to talk about. So I'll just sort of pass it around. Marianne, any comments, questions? Yeah, I, I, I wanted to riff a little bit off what Philippa said um, with this idea of new perspectives, right? Because you're, you're in this new space and doing things that you might not have necessarily done. And, and one of the pillars of the work we do with the Creative Affairs Office is, uh, is around infrastructure. And, and when we were looking at that originally, we were thinking about it from a traditional space perspective, like what kind of work, how are we providing more space? How are we adapting existing space uh, to be available for creatives? And one of the things that came out of uh, the, the first couple months of COVID is us rethinking what infrastructure is to also mean personal infrastructure, like, like human infrastructure. And it led us to developing a partnership with George Washington University that provides uh, pay what you can mental health care for any creative entrepreneur, small business in the DMV, that's the, the area, the DC area, uh, who needs it, you know? And, and it's, awesome. it's just made me rethink about like, when we talk about infrastructure, what is that? Because if you as an artist, as a creative, as a, as a small business owner, aren't okay, if you're not okay, how do you then take advantage of all the other resources that exist to support you? You know, so it starts from you first. And so we really do feel like that mental health, public health space is actually a part of our work as, as a creative ecosystem builders. And so, uh, and that is not something I would have thought before because mental health has come up, but I've never really seen it within our wheelhouse, right? I was ordered to play, like, I, I, don't, I don't know where, what our role is there. But um, if it wasn't for COVID, we never would have gone down this, this route. And so, and I'm very happy that it has changed my perspective in that way and led us to do something, you know, very meaningful. Fabulous. Philippa. Um, I just noticed a comment by Rebecca Gates about how, you know, some folks are just under too much stress to be creative. And I want to just recognize that because I, I feel very fortunate and lucky to be in a position where I am. And so I totally agree with you. And I think that we have to be very expansive when we're thinking about, you know, our connections in the sense that I want to make more connections so I can be more creative and produce more and help others produce more. But um, also our work needs to encompass those who just aren't there yet. And so thank you for saying that. And I totally agree. And I, I hope that we can all work together and lift all of us up. I can so important. Thank you, Rebecca Gates, for, for getting us into that, that bit of conversation. Finally, Jesse, any parting thoughts, comments? Yeah, I'll just throw out a few word clusters. How about that? Uh, without any definitive, but just to put a pin in a couple different conversations that I think are super interesting right now. The, as I was, you know, thinking about how to prepare for this and, you know, what are the other creative ecosystems that out there that are really informing or could or should be informing what music's doing? And I will say as a quick aside, I actually think music is kind of ahead of the curve on almost all this. And, and talking with Allison, my boss here, who comes from the dance world and from arts philanthropy, she said she's been blown away by how, frankly, by how folks like yourselves have organized so powerfully and so quickly. And I think that is very much the music community ethos. And I actually think that most other creative and arts forms have more to learn from music than vice versa <laughs> right now. So we're trying to, we're trying to hip them to all that. But I would say two, two areas that are, that I think are really interesting in our education. Um, uh, and, and I don't mean just arts education, but I mean education in general, all, all many things that we've talked about, some of the stuff that you brought up in a, uh, around pedagogy, around communication, around like what it actually means to exchange information with other human beings, artistic or otherwise. Um, I think we're all learning a lot of hard and good lessons about that in this crazy Zoom world and, and outside of it. And then I would say in the, on the, that's the URL side that I'm thinking a lot about in the IRL side, um, architecture and, and real estate and sort of spatial design, I think are a pretty fascinating topic right now. If, if you assume that they, as I do, that we're never going to go back to a quote unquote normal, at least not one it looks like before it'd be a, a new type of normal. And I think I, I'm seeing a lot of the most interesting work come from architectural firms, public art projects. We're being asked to consult on a lot of space reconceptualizations and say, how, how, how do we sort of future proof this and how do we make it resilient and how do we tie in the sort of emergency preparedness conversation too that a lot of folks on this call and in 
and other conversations have been a part of. How, how do you, how does music infrastructure help larger social infrastructure when it comes to building and running spaces that are gonna, that we're gonna need in the future, whether it's for diseases or climate change or any one of a number of things that are probably coming at us pretty quickly. Um, so I think a, a lot of innovative work is going on in that, in that domain as well. So I'll just throw those out. Thank you all. Thank you for a fabulous panel. It was so great to see all of you. And for all the comments that people have been putting in, um, I will pass it back to uh, Michael Bracey for our next Global Perspectives panel. <laughs>